So, uh, welcome back. Thanks, Ron. Uh, welcome back to our uh, sixth panel already. That's right. <laughs> and yes, and um, the panel's title is The Concerns and Lights of Apparatus. <coughs> and uh, the first paper presenter is Mike Lauder. And it's a little bit funny to present him to you, but nevertheless, uh, in case you forgot some of his interests or research achievements. So, uh, after holding postdocs in Moscow and Sweden, uh, Mike is currently, as we all know, Leverhulme Trust Early Career Fellow here at the Department of Central and East European Studies at the University of Glasgow, and uh, hopefully soon permanent fellow here, uh, as we all hope. And he's also the assistant editor of the Journal of Baltic Studies. His research interests include the workings of the Soviet Communist Party, nationality politics, center periphery relations, and of course, the Soviet Baltic. His publications have appeared in Europe Asia Studies, Nationalities Papers, the Slavonic and East European Review, and the Journal of Baltic Studies. And his current project is entitled Center Periphery Relations and Flux national politics and the Soviet borderlands. And yeah, you see here this title, the shadows of Old Square, more than anti Khrushchev, deep state on the Central Committee apparatus. Thank you very much, Susanna. So my turn. Um, and I give you something provocative. Um, but let's get started. Contemporary conservative media in the United States has been awash with the term the deep state for over a decade. This amorphous term was used pejoratively during the presidency of uh, Donald Trump um, to criticize a supposed resistance within uh, the US bureaucracy towards Trump's agenda. And the term has been ascribed to the British civil service, and the Brits here might remember this, um, uh, and its significant level of autonomy. And the characteristics and behavior of the British civil service as a deep state was most memorably and wittily portrayed in the personage of Humphrey Appleby, the cabinet secretary in the popular BBC comedy of the 1980s, Yes, Prime Minister. Um, Appleby is shown to be a manipulative, uh, able to manipulate the prime minister, obfuscating his agenda with the civil service, deciding what reforms and policies are practical rather than the elected politicians, um, and ensuring that it was the civil service which judged which was what was best for Britain, which well, in actuality was what was best for the civil service. So a deep state, it is framed as a shadowy cohort of unelected career bureaucrats who would burrow deep into the departments of government and concentrated real decision making power in their hands, using it to stymie political policies not to their liking. And these wry and rhetorical uh, contemporary Western uses of the deep state, the term deep state, complicate its historical application, but I'm going to have some fun with it. So, in my view, stripped of its colorful, provocative connotations for public consumption, it can be useful for explaining a certain period of Soviet history. Um, and the Western uses of the term, the deep state, can be applied to the institution of the apparatus, the apparat of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union during the late 1950s and the early 1960s, during the rule of First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev. When the Soviet premier was systematically undermined by his own party apparatus. And the apparatus possessed extraordinary importance within the Soviet hierarchy. When Khrushchev um, uh, restored the powers of the party um, after Stalin had hollowed them out, the Central Committee returned to the gravitational uh, center of party power below the Presidium, later known as the Politburo. Yet, in the Central Committee, um, the Central Committee was not a standing body and it met infrequently. Day-to-day -day responsibilities were thus carried out de facto by the Central Committee apparatus, which concentrated enormous power in its hands. And the apparatus was synonymous with the running of the party on behalf of the Central Committee, hence why it was known and was referred to by the location of the Central Committee headquarters in uh, Central Moscow, uh, Staraya Posha, uh, Old Square. The apparatus's role as the hub of the party was enhanced by its function as the instrument through which the Presidium and the Secretariat, um, that's the party's leading executive bodies, transmitted their instructions. And this permitted the apparatus wide latitude in their interpretation of these instructions and decisions, and even involvement in their formulation. For example, by sometimes drafting the Presidium and the Secretariat's decisions. The apparatus, uh, and within it specifically the Department for Union Republics, was the transmission belt for the Presidium's decision 
uh, decisions regarding the Soviet republics. The department informed the Republican Communist parties of the decisions of the Presidium, supervised their implementation, and crucially, investigated complaints if they were judged to be violations. So, and Alex and I were sort of arguing about this in the pub last night, and so I'm going to put in this, this clause right now and say, when I'm saying apparat, I'm going deeper and saying the Department for Party Organs specifically, the Department with this ability to have exercise influence. Um, and, I, and, and I can say that, uh, that I want to say that the, the Department of Party Organs became a deep state within the apparatus, uh, as deep states are not formed from whole bureaucratic organs, um, uh, which would be more akin to a bureaucratic coup. This is, in fact, they rather nestle inside the bureaucratic machinery. So that's what I'm trying to get at. So the apparatus also, or the department, acted as the arbiter of disputes in the republics. The department determined what was and what was, was not uh, acceptable at any given time within its closed system of justice. The department decided if a matter needed investigating, conducted any subsequent inspection itself, formulated the report on the issue to the Presidium and Secretariat, and even recommended action to be taken. Thus, there was no independent adjudication. The, apparatus, well, the department played all the roles of judge, jury, and executioner in party disputes itself. And this is why we repeatedly see in the, decision, in the recollections of former party functionaries their talk of closely watching the signals from Moscow. Except, I would argue, that these signals were not the smoke emanating from the Kremlin, but rather from Staraya Posha where the apparatus, or rather the department's whims, determined the fate of a given leadership if they overstepped these invisible lines of nationalism and autarky. And this is why the Soviet periphery and the center came to blows in the late 1950s, I argue. Despite Khrushchev's re-empowerment of the party and the, uh, and the limited economic and political decentralization that he offered to the republics as part of the de-Stalinization de uh, and the thaw, um, that took place in Soviet society and politics after Stalin's death, the department remained vigilant and it launched assaults on Republican leaderships they perceived to be going too far. When attacked, these leaderships attempted to appeal directly to Khrushchev over the heads of the department because they feared these apparatchiks and their attempts to tarnish these leaders' reputations in their eyes. And I have, uh, you know, this on, you know, um, an Azerbaijani uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, official saying exactly that. So these, um, these employees of Old Square, they were an odd breed, a strange breed. These 2,000 or so employees uniformly wore blue suits in the summer and dark suits in the winter. They lived apart from everyone else in, in special apartment blocks, socialized only amongst themselves and their families, and they frequented special shops. In short, they were disconnected from, um, from Soviet society at large in their bubble, and thus they, they, um, they developed their own rigid vision for how the country should be run and the rules that should, uh, the party should follow. They, uh, they viewed their position as the arbiter between the party leadership and the republics and the guardian of the Soviet system. And these distinctly different political workers fused their political fervor with a Soviet-style bureaucratic appetite for power. Um, and they were hostile to a new, the new culture of experimentation under Khrushchev. And I classify the department as a Soviet deep state during the late Khrushchev era, uh, a covert governmental network operating independently of the state's uh, political leadership and goals. So why the deep states develop? Um, they appear when powerful bureaucracies oppose the government of the day during especially experimental eras, in this case, Khrushchev's reforms. As a deep state, the apparatus obfuscated Khrushchev's decisions and leadership and attempted to influence him. They influenced what I call the Red Cardinals, um, powerful conservatives within the Soviet leadership in order to carry out purges of the leaderships in the republics. And they administered their own closed process of justice when they detected violations in party policy in what they considered their own fiefdom, the Soviet republics. This was unilateral action beyond established boundaries through subterfuge and manipulation of the country's senior political leadership and its coordinated, uh, and, and coordinated decision making uh, by a faction of the bureaucracy. <coughs> so 
I've got very little time, but I'm going to just mention a little bit about the purges that are my main reason for, for, for thinking this. So it was a scorching summer's day on the 1st of July, 1959 in Moscow. And in the Kremlin, tempers were running, were, were flaring, where Khrushchev was doing what came naturally to him, creatively haranguing apparatchiks. <laughs> At an enlarged meeting of the Presidium, the 14 leaders of the Soviet republics listened to what was effectively a warning to them all. As Khrushchev singled out one of their number, the secretary, um, Imam Mustafayev was of Azerbaijan, and asked him, quote, are you ashamed of rolling in the swamps of bourgeois nationalism? So many excellent people have been promoted, but the shit floats to the top. We will clear it out like a housemaid does when she cooks borscht and then skim off the scum with a spoon. <laughs> One week later, Mustafayev was ousted from his post, and a purge of the Azerbaijani Communist Party ensued. That same day in Latvia, an extensive purge of the party began. This followed purges in Turkmenistan in, in December 1958, uh, Uzbekistan in March 1959. There was a parallel effort made in summer 1959 in Lithuania. By May 1961, a further four to five other republics would also feel the axe coming down on their leaderships. Kazakhstan, Armenia, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and uh, as we've heard a little bit, it's, it's possible Moldova, uh, Moldavia. This episode in Soviet political history is not well known. Several scholars have noted simultaneous purging, but few have drawn any of the dots to connect them in any way, nor explored the wider meaning of this wave of purges in the Soviet periphery. The department, however, has attracted the attention, from the Union of Republics' attack, uh, uh, um, has attracted the attention of prominent political historians, they're in this room, Alex, Saulius, and Nikolai, um, because they recognized that the apparatus in the department were, uh, were a major power center, and um, it had more pre decision-making capacity than previously thought. But in 1957, grave concerns formed among conservative elements within the Kremlin leadership, um, the Red Cardinals. These, they were joined in their concern by the powerful uh, uh, department, um, uh, the, the, especially the hardline grey personnel who worked in the department, who were troubled by the increasingly nationally oriented policies of the leaderships of many Soviet republics. Following the aftershocks of the Hungarian uprising, Polish October, the anti-party group affair, and the start of the Khrushchev thaw. Yet this now appears to me to be a case of the tail wagging the dog, as we say in English, with the department influencing the opinions of the Red Cardinals. And previously, I had come to believe that the culprits were the Red Cardinals themselves when I published this argument in an extensive chapter in Saulius's edited volume. So you can read it and tell me I'm wrong, if you like, <laughs> um, uh, or try to, um, uh, uh, because it's all down there, as I argue it uh, in black and white. Um, uh, yet now I think that the, the, the department was shaping events. The department alerted senior leaders to incidents it knew would outrage them. Then it led the formulation or an implementation of their response. The, the, the department were the real ideological dogmatists. Suslov was obviously not teamed up with uh, Shelepin and Semichansny, um, although it was only a bit later that they really became antagonistic. But this is the point. The key conservative players were, in my opinion, being induced to act by the department. It was the most important and preeminent department within the apparatus. As Alex tells us, the uh, head of the department was so powerful uh, a post that it was equivalent to a central committee secretary. It's not a coincidence that the purges began in late 1958, when the department began to flex its muscles again, um, with new Red Cardinal uh, uh, support following a period of dormancy um, during 1957, when it had been leaderless for over a year, uh, after uh, Khrushchev's man Yevgeny Gromov departed, and the department had probably been encouraged to relax oversight on the republics by a grateful Khrushchev after the anti-party group affair when he relied on them. Um, also, the department staff was, uh, had been considerably reduced uh, in 1957. So, um, let me now just very, and I'm going to have to skip most of this, but the, um, the five-phase strategy hypothesis of mine, um, uh, I'm going to just briefly mention now. So, Encouraged by the environment of Khrushchev's thaw and given a somewhat freer hand, particularly in comparison with the Stalin era, from 1956, the republics began to indigenize the makeup of their cabinets, prioritize and promote the use of their language and culture, and even push back against some central policies like the Russifying 1958 education reform. The department's uh, concern manifested itself in interference in the administration of these republics. 
Naturally, there is no, of course, no smoking gun, um, uh, no verifiable written orders from, uh, for purges from the Red Cardinals or the department, um, except the department head's bold assertion that he masterminded the Latvian and Azerbaijani purges in his memoirs. There are, however, admissions and plenty of memoirs, interviews, and archival evidence to support this argument, in my view. And using this, um, I have uh, evidence, I've developed a theory of a five-phase strategy for how these purges were conducted. But I'm going to skip the details right now. Um, uh, maybe I can come back to it. But um, the result of the five-phase strategy was the fall of the leaderships of eight or nine Soviet republics. There's nothing inevitable about these purges, by the way. I don't argue that. They, they could be warded off, as in the case of Estonia and Georgia, or they're directly rebuffed in Lithuania through personal connections to the um, uh, department and red cardinals, and through, and that's why Lithuania stands out as this great example, uh, through unified homogenous party leaderships. So, yet though this wave of, through this wave of purges, we can identify the inner functions and the independent action of that shadowy overlooked powerhouse the department within the Central Committee apparatus. So I think that Khrushchev was manipulated into friendly fire attacks. He did not profit from these purges um, with six or seven of nine dismissed leaders being Khrushchev appointees. Uh, the purges actually reveal his weaknesses and how they were exploited. And his own protégés began to isolate him and thereby contradicting any notion of Khrushchev's monolithic control. The Red Cardinals were flexing their muscles, a prelude to their later roles, by the way, um, uh, as the um, uh, conspiratorial actors who engineered the fall of Khrushchev in 1964. It's actually not that hard to believe when you take into account they actually did this anyway to get rid of Khrushchev several years later. I'm just arguing that they were doing it a bit before in a different capacity. And I also think it's worth pointing out that um, we all know that after the bifurcation of the party apparatus by Khrushchev in 1962, um, we know that they were super upset about that and began to work against him. So um, that's why I'm saying um, that um, it's not an unprecedented idea, uh, you know, that because we know that they began to work against Khrushchev a bit later, I'm saying a bit before. So, um, I think that the department achieved their aims by either attempting to influence Khrushchev's decisions or resorting to subverting his wishes. External observers have claimed that officials around Khrushchev misguided him. Yugoslav ambassador to the USSR, Filipo Mikunovic, was convinced that Khrushchev was, quote, systematically misinformed by his own bureaucracy, end quote. Khrushchev was kept regularly updated on the investigations in the republics. His Kremlin office log shows that Shilyapin visited him on the day as his Central Committee report was filed on the Turkmen affair. And that's Shilyapin's own report. Um, and again, on the day the Presidium discussed the Uzbek case, Deputy Department Head uh, Pyotr Pigalyov had an audience with Khrushchev just after supervising the purge at the Uzbek plenum. The problem was that these informants with access to Khrushchev were precisely the Red Cardinals and department personnel working against him to try to manipulate him. And we also know that Khrushchev experienced bureaucratic resistance to his Sovna Hoz reform to, um, uh, and the corn growing campaign. So it's again, it's not a great leap. We know that this happened to Khrushchev, you know. Um, as Ron has put it, um, quote, to quote you, Ron, Khrushchev dominated through his personal authority, though occasionally he was forced to retreat from his preferred positions. End quote. I like it. <laughs> this, this limited Khrushchev's ability to exercise power, yet it did not completely enfeeble him as a leader, because he seems to have been aware of attempts to shape his own opinion, shape his opinion, and he remained skeptical of evidence he was shown, preferring to question the accused himself. Khrushchev even alluded to the intransigence 
Um, he, he, um, that's not what my clock says, right? Anyway, oh, it does, all right. Um, yeah, um, Khrushchev uh, um, himself even alluded to the intransigence of the department, and he complained of his inability to exercise power to Fidel Castro. He, you can see the quote, he said, you, you, I'm gonna do it because I like doing Khrushchev. You think you, I could change anything in this country? Like hell I can. No matter what changes I propose and carry out, everything stays the same. Um, Russia is like a, a tub full of dough. You put your hand down into it, down to the bottom, and you think you are the master of the situation. When you pull your hand out, a little hole remains. But then, before your very eyes, the dough expands into a spongy, puffy mass. And that's what Russia is like, end quote. So let me just uh, crack on with the motivations of the department. The nationalism, um, uh, as the employees of the apparatus, uh, consider, uh, the department rather, considered it, was the placing of the interests of a given republic above those of the all union. The party leaderships in the republics were expected to be loyal to the center, but the activities of the uh, department when detecting any whiff of what it perceived as nationalism and safeguards, such as the, the role of the watchdog uh, second secretary on the ground, show that this expectation was not realized in practice or often violated. Furthermore, the department was especially sensitive in this regard, within which there existed a general atmosphere documented by Nikolai of chauvinism, um, uh, uh, xenophobia, Russian uh, ethno-nationalism, and antipathy towards non-Russian nationalists in the periphery. Thus, rather than being set up by, many, by any group within the apparatus, I hypothesized that this deep state evolved um, within the department based on the common principles held among its staff and that the department attracted zealots who emerged from the party's training schools and regions. Although perceived nationalism, and uh, uh, leaders in the republics, of course, viewed things very differently. Um, they were just promoting things, uh, 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 you know, nationally oriented, defending their language um, uh, and uh, cultures. But it was this perceived nationalism and specifically anti-Russian dis discrimination, which were the main motivating factors in the department's decision to intervene in the republics. Uh, politics. The archival stenographs show that what the department really could not abide was local politicians <coughs> making unilateral decisions without the department's approval. Saulius has noted this too. The time and again in their clashes with, um, with Latvian leaders at the Latvian Bureau and in their reports to the Presidium, the department's inspectors complained that the Latvians had pledged to provide free school textbooks, which privileged the Latvian pupils in comparison to the rest of the country. During the Kyrgyz purge in 1961, Department Chairman uh, Vitaly Titov raged at the Kyrgyz leaders for a resolution providing free school meals, a trivial area that um, the Kyrgyz leaders clearly assumed during the thaw was under their purview. But Titov berated the leadership for exceeding their rights um, and, like Latvia, placing their own interests above those of the whole state. Titov lectured the Kyrgyz. Did you not have a telephone connection? You only had to lift the receiver and discuss the situation." End quote. Of course, the department was not really quibbling about free school meals and textbooks or the supposedly unacceptable costs of these initiatives. What irked the department was decentralization and the breaking of the custom by which regional party organizations had to ask the center's approval before making a decision on any subject no matter how trivial, and never do so without authorization. I'm going to conclude now. So there is, of course, this question of organization. Is the deep state an organized faction? Well, obviously, in the, um, in the contemporary right with violence, of course not, but it serves a purpose as an amorphous spoil for them rather than any more substantial. Yet a deep state network should be organized by definition. And the department was certainly organized. Whether there was any in a clique um, is beyond its bounds. It's almost impossible to determine. Um, and it prevents, it, this prompts the countervailing question that I get, which is, were they not merely carrying out their functions and doing their job, or even launching uh, punitive action against republics as a crude form of lobbying as an interest group, um, uh, rather than a more egregious case of deliberately baiting the Soviet leadership with the red meat of nationalism. And I would say that it was, it was, it was representative, were well, they not representative of the deep, of, of the party state, rather than deep state. Um, but I think that uh, they were acting beyond their remit, uh, exaggerating reporting, what was happening, obfuscating Khrushchev's wishes, twisting his understanding, and demonstrating intent, that demonstrates intent on the part of the department to misinform and manipulate. And I've got to stop. So I will say one last thing, which was that these inspectors that I said, there were complaints about them uh, for um, 
for their behavior, sniffing out imagined nationalism. Um, uh, they, uh, I believe to the, them to be the ideological zealots um, and uh, who, you know, who sought to manipulate the opinions of both conservatives and reformers within the leadership um, and pursue these goals independent of the country's political leadership. Um, so uh, I think we better stop. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Salius Kukauskas. And uh, he's a senior research fellow at the Lithuanian Institute of History. His research interests include Soviet central periphery relations, central agency in the Soviet republics, Soviet nationality policy, and nomenklatura networks. He has published the monograph, The Soviet Nomenklatura and Industry in Lithuania between 1965 in 1985 in Lithuania in 2011, and governing the Soviet Union's National Republics, the second Secretaries of Communist Party, which was published in English in 2021. He is also the co-editor and co-author of several monographs, including a political biography of Valgirdas Skradauskas in 2018 and Moscow and the non-Russian republics in the Soviet Union in 2022, so just very uh, recently. And you have a presentation or? Yes, but I think someone deleted my presentation from desktop. I, I can find it. No, don't look at me. Uh, <laughs> I, I think what happens Wrong. is that, oh, is no. that they, uh, overnight it gets wiped. So oh, is my... Okay. okay. Where's so, the... so I will use your presentation then. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, I'm keep going. No, no, I, I think it is not in the state. Oh, okay. Was it? Did you give it to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What was it called? Last bit. I, I didn't find it. That, that. No, no, that's. Uh, okay. <laughs> So you see already the title, um, Soviet Nomenclatura Letters to Moscow, Content and Issues. So, thank you, Susanna. And thank you, Mike, for the very nice presentation. And of course, for organizing this conference. I remember last fall we met in, in Riga and discussed this issue. So you presented this idea about conference. And it was exact day when the Latvian government pronounced complete lockdown. Mm -hmm. You catch the, this uh, COVID. Oh, we were in the sauna. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, and uh, I remember how I was skeptical about this, this whole issue about your idea a little bit because, because you know, COVID, you know, time it's not easy. But I'm very happy that that this this idea, your idea, is going to be is realizing now. So. Uh, Mike's presentation was mainly about uh, about uh, this party organ department, deep states. Yeah, so I, I would like to turn a little bit to general department. This, this, this is not to say that general department uh, was more important than party organ department, but uh, I think it, it is it is worth to, to, to talk about it. So the topic of Soviet complaints it's not new. Uh, Alona Bogdanova, Sheila Fitzpatrick, and many others widely <laughs> investigated this topic as a number of researchers use letters and complaints for their particular topics like Lithuanian Neringa Kumbita. This question would be what else we could add in researchers' complaints and letters. If we take a literature, we will see concentration on relations between society and government, particularity of these complaints, classification of letters, and so on. My area is a bit different. I look inside power, inside institutions, searching how we operate it. Because of that, I'm not interested in ordinary people with letters only in rules of high level nomenclatura. My working questions are what complaints and the investigation in central committee apparatus could add to our knowledge about nomenclatura. My research area is 
political history, nomenclature networks. On the, on the other hand, we have fashion and threat of populism in overplaying the national auditorium. Auditorium today likes to, to read spicy material about ex nomenclature scenes. We, we, we have like two fronts one pure academic and another one popular history. And I think sometimes we need to keep a balance between this. Recently, Ergani declassified de some files, including Font 100, which is consisted from documents of General Department of Central Committee of KPSU. Files in this and other fonts or of Ergani could suggest interesting topic, which is not limited to one particular so Soviet Republic. There are many documents that include annual reports of department about work with letters and complaints, various information and reports of its instructors on this issue, lectures of the department about, ads, about how to work with letters and statistical information about quantity of received letters, problems and questions of complaints and answers to them. My research encompasses both areas. First of all, system and evaluation, how apparatus in Moscow saw this kind of letters. Was it important area for functioners or just kind of formal demonstration on sensibility? How we investigated letters, how inspected? Uh, the second area is center periphery relations. Questions here is how well Moscow was informed about activity of local nomenclature. Could be the kind of conversion of letters uh, to into compromise against heads of republics. And letters and complaints are useful for penetration into the networks of local nomenclature. And finally, it gives us sense of everyday life in Soviet republics, main questions and problems. Work with letters and complaints was important part of apparatus activities, and we can find many loud expressions about that. Brezhnev in 25 party congress said that central committee highly estimates work with workers letters as one of the form which demonstrate the enthusiasm of people of millions also of huge and powerful state in building of communism we we see real massiveness of letters for example only in 1977 Central Committee of KPSU, Central Committee of Soviet Republics, Avkomi and Krajkomi received 1,200,000 letters. As many things in Soviet Union, this direction of work with letters turned into bureaucratic practices. Vera Borlitsky and Oleg Klebnik argues that party apparatus was overflowed by various documents and letters received from citizens whose ability to implement kind of system and maintain it boosted importance of the general department and career of its head, Chernenko. And Kostya, so this is how, how, how Brezhnev called uh, Konstantin Chernenko, and we can find in, in, in Susanna's book about Kostya, about Yura, Andrusha, <laughs> and others, but I think Pivotkov said that it was, it, it was too, too much, too, too much uh, of cost uh, because, because, uh, and sometimes uh, Konstantin Chernenko didn't like it, but couldn't escape. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, and improving of the system of documents flow in Central Committee apparatus made Chernenko as one of the most influential leaders in the Central Committee. Of course, here we meet the danger of overestimation as document management as well Chernenko's role in this. If we take minutes of protocols from 1967, then important resolution was taken about parties work with workers' letters, we will see that Kirilenko and Ustinov talked mainly in the secretariat on these issues. Chernenko was only included in the working group that consisted from Shelepin and others. And that, that had to improve a project of, of resolution considering the dates in the meeting. One should understand that uh, ordinary head uh, of the department could not lead in the secretariat's meetings, uh, even if he was directly responsible for this issue. We should pay attention to the words said in the meeting that the draft is too ambitious in sense of presenting the resolution 
as the only one in this kind of in the history of Soviet state. This critical suggestion was true in August 1958. <coughs> Central Committee took resolution a serious недостаток в рассмотрении писем, жалоб и заявлений трудящихся. On the other hand, the fact that authors of the draft even did not mention this 1958 resolution shows that new period in documents management started in 1967 and this subject was directly related with Chernenko. Emphasis on, on importance of letters and practice of working with the staff allowed Chernenko to raise his own status in the leadership. In 1976, he became a central committee secretary from ordinary head of department. Uh, in, in 1977, he became candidate mem member, and finally in 1978, full member of Politburo. Politburo. He and his cycle contributed to ideological language and expressions that fitted very much to Brezhnev's notion of work with Kadri. In March 1979, Central Committee issued the second resolution on the same work with the letters. We shouldn't look at this uh, regulation as just boring form of question. Here we can see some accumulation of power in the hands of general department inside of apparatus. All letters received in Central Committee of KFSU were tracked by, by general department. The department had, had also Spravochnaya Priyomnaya. This is not to say that the <laughs> department itself investigated complaints. The main task of the department was to deliver letters among various central committee departments and all union institutions to get feedback from them and report about the general situation in working with letters to leadership. In 1977, the central committee, KBSU, received 657,000 letters, 50,000 or 12% of that the department is directed to various central committee departments, the same amount to all union ministries, and 320,000 of letters were sent to republics and opcoms. One could say that instructors of department work as kind of curators for other departments in this letters matter. For example, instructor of the department, Alexandrova, curated work with letters in organizational party work department. And you, you can see abstract from the report to, to his boss. Complaints related with local nomenclature usually were sent to department of organizational party work. From the history of this department, we can see how we communicated with local nomenclature. As a rule, information about misleading of functionaries was sent to Communist Party second secretary, who, who was like most of a representative in a Soviet Republic. For example, in her report, in her report about work in 1973, Alexandrova mentions communication with the second secretaries in Uzbekistan, Lomonosov, Moldavia, Melanishev, Armenia, Anisimov. <laughs> At the same time, we see communication with first secretary of Soviet Georgia, Eduard Shevardnadze, regarding one letter of uh, 1976 about nationalism in Abkhazia. This demonstrates that Shevardnadze took the question seriously and he preferred to keep direct communication with, with Central Committee of KPSU. And uh, of course, most important part was surveys. So, so not just managing your letters, letters flow, but also making surveys, thematical surveys about some issues to 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 leadership of KPSL. You see in the slide. And for example, in 1972, the department prepared prepared a survey about the internationalism in Soviet Union because of 50 year anniversary of Soviet Union, and this. This, this is quite a big, big note, a big, big zapiska about nationalism, starting from Ukraine, starting talking about the uh, uh, Shelley's book, Ukraina uh, Maya Radzanska, yes, with this, uh, about criticizing it, uh, speaking about the uh, Ukrainization of Crimea uh, uh, and other things, so, so, and of course, including other republics. So we, we see that uh, 
that basing on letters, the department entered into field of other departments. Speaking concretely about complaints against functionaries, we see that in 1976, Central Committee received more than 1,200 letters of this kind of issues, and in 245 letters, <laughs> facts about misbehavior of nomenclature were confirmed. As for 1977, we see even bigger quantity. Central Committee received more than 13,000 letters on organizational party work. More than 4,000 letters were related with misconduct of functionaries. After check in KPSU, facts about functionaries misleading were confirmed regarding 502 cases. Many of these kind of letters were anonymous. How the Soviet system perceived anonymous letters? This question is not easy. Formally, every person had a right to, to address to, to leadership. On the other hand, institution used to persecute authors for so-called slander. Grassroots collectives like primary party organizations were also involved in disciplining authors of letters. They usually argued that an author became in a proper way, he or she would write, should, should write to lower institution first, not to Moscow, not to power, Brezhnev, other leaders with, with letters. Yeah. Lectures and presentations given in Old Square for local functionaries from the public and outcomes obviously show that it was not obvious even for nomenclature in high party level how to treat anonymous letters. How estimate such letters in comparison with signed letters? Here, quote from one lecture in general department in 1974. And one thing I want to add about work with letters, which is clear not for all, how to behave with unsigned letters, anonymous. We think that outlook to this sh should be the same serious as to sign ones. Why? That's simply because we are interested in content of a letter, not in matter who wrote it. In the first place, we should, should take facts laid out in, the, in a letter, not to a question who did write it, and this is the right requirement, requirement of the part. I have to say to you that after analysis of letters without signature, we found right proof, proof facts from 40 to 70 percent considering various republics and obviously. Of course, we can't deny it that under some anonymous uh, space slanderer, we have to find such person and bring them to strong responsibility. While Apparatus spoke about the importance of complaints content. We see from archived documents, documents that these letters were evaluated quite differently from signed letters. That is obvious from scrapy of functionaries in Central Committee who were responsible for following an interpretation of concrete letter. In a bottom of such scrapy, we could find written by hand with a pencil. Without signature, you can see in the slide, yeah? without signature or just anonymous, whose formerly unsigned letters that had the same status as ordinary complaints, yet informally this kind of letters had lower status, status. Yeah, and because of that, anonymous authors tried to find ways how to convince Moscow to pay attention to so-called facts. Usually in the beginning of nomenclature, anonymous uh, letters stay stay argument that authors of a letter are prominent party or Soviet persons who spent much of their li life in fight against Soviet enemies, their communist podpolshiki, Soviet ex-partisans or soldier, soldiers who <coughs> fought against Nazis. Second usual feature is arguing that functionaries against whom is a letter is very powerful and authors has fear for, for revenge. And finally, one letter from Kazakhstan in which authors argue that the, the previous letter, letter was proved to be right, and a few functionaries in Kazakhstan were fired from position as a result of that letter. They, they argue because of that, you cannot treat as anonymous. So, so you can see two letters, beginning of letters, so, so first pages. 
from Kazakhstan and from Moldavia, so against Bulgaria. So very targeted. Okay, so, so and at the end of my presentation, I would like to, to speak a little bit about uh, one letter, particular letter that, that is important and interesting for me, especially because I started my this project from this letter I found it in, in Argani, and this letter is quite long, it's 13 pages, and uh, you can see, you can feel that this letter was written by Lithuanian, you can see from grammar, from mistakes, right? uh, and uh, Lithuanian, Lithuanian way of sentences, so, so just see. And of, okay, of course. Okay, <laughs> so, okay. and the uh, other thing is uh, like, you, you can feel that it, it, is, it was written by inside and uh, in very high position. So, and I guess, I have guess that, that it was written by Motil Schumann, Schumauskas, who was a very close friend of Sniechko's previous leader of Soviet Lithuania. And, and he, he was angry, angry because Grishkevich was how to step, step down him, aside, aside, who, who get, he, he aside. But I like this expression, how, how he said, how, how he wrote, wrote it in his letter. Но многие товарищи коллективного мнения попросили меня. So, so, so he is representing a group, so, so some group. So, and, uh, and, and I have guessed who, who, who were involved in this group. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and this, this uh, letter is very targeted, so very concrete. So, so he spoke about many things. And if you are doing studies about networks, about nomenclatura networks, and you know these issues, so, so you can get the feeling. So, so this is the right things that, that he is writing about exact things, important things. So he, he wrote about, in this letter, we, we can find about Sophia the second. So it's like a wife, Vishkevich's wife, and why the second? Because Sophia the first was a wife of Lithuanian dictator Antanas Natonas in bourgeois times, so it's, <laughs> it's very interesting. You, you can see some, some time, yes, some some relations with the past. So so not just about Soviet times. So so and many things like hunting, yeah, so agriculture things and uh, resources distribution of resources, failures in distribution of resources. So so it's interesting and, and I think yeah. So and of course. After that, then uh, those uh, is small spravka of written by, signed by Valentin Nikiforov. He was deputy head of department. And uh, this, this letter, his spravka was, uh, note, note was, is very positive against, uh, 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 towards uh, Soviet Lithuanian leadership. But nevertheless, I found that this information was included in other resolutions against Soviet Lithuanian leadership. So, so you can see how these letters and information were transformed to compromise. And this compromise was kept in, in the Central Committee. Thank you for your attention. Can you help me with uh, mm -hmm. So while they put up the presentation, I already will introduce uh, Kolya Mikrofin. Uh, it is also quite funny because we are working in Britain together since 2008. So Kolya is an associate research fellow at the Research Center for East European Studies at the University of Bremen. And he received his PhD in history from the Russian State University for, Humanity, for the Humanities in 2002, and afterwards worked for a couple of years with Memorial at the Human Rights Center in Moscow, so until 2005. And then, as a fellow of the German Humboldt Foundation, he came first to Berlin and then uh, to Bremen. 
Uh, he is the author and co-author of several books, as you probably know, about the Russian Orthodox Church and the Russian nationalist, nationalist movement in the USSR. And uh, Koya has recently completed a book about Soviet economic policy between 1965 and 1989. I think we all wait for it. And uh, his book on the uh, um, we also are waiting desperately for and it's hopefully soon be published with Oxford University Press. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm presented now the, my uh, another book project about the uh, uh, apparat. Uh, I concentrated in the social history of the Soviet apparatchik and uh and the central organ of uh power in the soviet union uh, and today it was uh briefly uh about um uh why the answer for the question why uh the apparatchik at sakakopsis and the uh, 21st uh, August 1991, uh, uh, not to give a Kalashnikov in their hands and not defend, uh, uh, not defend uh, their um, buildings uh, like it's, it made the Assad, for example, uh, his guy Lukashenko and his guy in the situation was one, one big. Uh, mass of people come to the building and say, wait, go away. Uh, uh, so uh, when we talked about the uh, uh, from Tsaka, uh, usually people from the perestroika talked it was old guys so with no education, with, which was a form of uh, Komsomol uh, uh, activist and so on. Uh, but the reality, I used the uh, base, uh, I collected near 260 biographies, uh, which are real cool biographies, not so called objective or short biographies, for, um, which was produced the system. Uh, the common biographies give uh, some another uh, picture. First one, we have to say uh, that. Um, it was uh, relatively homogeneous uh, uh, social movement. So it was really white men, uh, Slavs, most of them Russians so or Ukrainians, uh, some some uh, uh, Belarusians. Uh, they have um, very well level of education, which was a surprise for me. Uh, uh, they half of them uh, finished uh, the prominent Moscow uh, high schools, uh, and a relatively big part of them have the PhD status. Uh, and people, for example, who work on the uh, international departments, uh, was. Uh, uh, finished uh, not only the high school but middle school also in Moscow. It's like the typical uh, example for young future apparatchik who are personally looks like the uh, one uh, placard pioneer, uh, uh, pioneer and they really was the uh, placard pioneers because the uh, big part of them minimum uh, thirty percent was the leaders of the pioneer, uh, pioneer uh, Kanyeska Drujina, uh, pioneer uh, lo local organization in the school. Uh, and uh, some of them, uh, I found eight uh, biographies, stayed the candidate to uh, Communist Party when they uh, uh, just uh, teaching in the school. And it was the practice in the 40s when the uh, when you uh, hear of the school consumer organization you have uh, can be the uh, candidate for uh, uh, members of party 
but anyway, uh, the Komsomol way was the wrong way for the future uh, apparatchik. Uh, just uh, at, uh, twenty percent of them uh, uh, was uh, uh, had the, some position in the uh, Komsom mostly Komsomol regional structure, and uh, not so much of them on the Central Committee of Komsomol. Um, if you wanted to have the position in the KGB, it was the right way to go to Komsomol, but not in the partner system. Uh, the most uh, important group uh, who come to the uh, Central Party apparat was the engineer from the uh, huge industrial um, uh, complexes, uh, most of them uh, uh, military complexes. So the uh, real government of uh, the Soviet Union uh, in the level of Politburo, it, it was the government of the engineer from WPK, uh, military industrial complex. Uh, but also in the Tskak KPSS apparat, which made the huge paperwork, uh, was also integrated a lot of the people with uh, the academic uh, background or the journalist background. Uh, it, was, it was not only the uh, so-called ideological departments, but also so-called Opsiadel, a common, <laughs> uh, common department which was organized all uh, uh, paperwork. It was the biggest uh, department of the Tsukaka uh, Also a lot of people from there. Um, uh but uh, more interesting to my mind uh, uh how uh, which which chance uh, chance had the people to come to uh, work to KPSS. Uh, all the guys from the soviet union or the all pioneers uh, active pioneers have this chance or not and this uh, reason uh, we can see that the social back, real social background of the apparatchiks who work from 50s and, uh, to 80s uh, <laughs> um, it was not the children of workers it, it was not absolutely children of uh, peasants it was most of them was uh, 70, uh, more than 70 percent or the children of Sluzhishi, so clerks in different level. Uh, it is uh, the popular idea from the uh, Vaslyansky and his book Nomenklatura uh, that the Soviet uh, uh, nomenklatura reproduce yourself. Uh, in general, he is right. The uh, uh, Soviet clerks uh, give uh, 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 his children's education enough to come to apparatus for psychiatric process. But Vaslensky told that the part party nomenclature reproduced itself. And he, uh, in this reason, he was wrong because most of the parents uh, were the engineer. Uh, a lot of the people working on in the finance, uh, finances and uh, trade sphere, uh, and uh, not uh, and only ten uh, ten percent of them uh, was the uh, real clerks in the state or part of bureaucracy. One step uh, more and. Uh, the new surprise for me was the how many parents of the Tsukaka parents apparatchik has the good education, uh, well educated, was the well educated in pre-revolution time, or uh, they started to study in the schools uh, in the pre-revolution time and produced the education in the uh, revolution post-revolution uh, period. Um, so uh, I found that uh, the middle class uh, for pre-revolution time uh, of the children of the middle class or upper middle class uh, can promote the education in the revolution time. 
uh, without the, of course, the separation and discrimination of the uh, middle class in the 20s. Anyway, uh, for many children, that uh, discrimination was not the uh, borders uh, for the stop of their careers. The Soviet Union, young Soviet Union needs the people who can read uh, and produce the text and uh, the children of nobilities or the children of the uh, local priests or the lo local uh, um, uh, professionals uh, can realize this chance. It's a typical uh, two families of them, uh, a typical Stalin's uh, culture elite in the small city of Zheb, in the uh, Karinian or now Tveri region. Uh, uh, one of uh, the experiences is the experiences of the Galina Sarapanikov, who was the uh, main ideologue <laughs> of the uh, school education of the Soviet Union of the 50s and 60s, uh, uh, working on in the uh, department of the And the other parents was the uh, parents of Sergei Pavlov, the head of the Komsomol organization, uh, all union Komsomol organization. When we study the biographies, it's a local old believers, Tarabrechiska elite in this city. For example, uh, uh, Sergei Pavlov's father uh, uh, has uh, uh, um, uh, high education in Moscow State University uh, and, and finished that in uh, 1901. And uh, lately was the uh, um, uh, teacher of the gymnasium in uh, RG. Uh, and uh, parents of uh, Sarafanikov was the uh, uh, book of in the, in the city, and some of them organized the Narodny Hari and so on. Um, so the problem, uh, the question was uh, how it was related with the revolution changes in the Soviet society. And we found in the biographies Tsaka uh, KPSS Aparachik that uh, two different uh, dimensions to different ways uh, to, uh, to elite uh, through the revolution and through the uh, um, culture uh, and professional realization uh, take each other in the 20s and family was the uh, father was the revolution guy from Taiga uh, from the uh, communist partisans and uh, mother who was the uh, who teach in uh, the gymnasium pre-revolution time because she was, uh, for example, uh, daughter of the um, local uh, specialist. It was usual a typical families uh, for Stalinist uh, elite or Stalinist uh, middle class. And uh, relatively big part of the so-called threats, uh, fathers and mothers, uh, was also the representative of the middle class in the pre-revolution time. For example, the uh, uh, daughter of the head uh, of the uh, customs in the Siberia, uh, then in the revolution was the active um, uh, like the communist uh, organizing Siberia, and then they give uh, the KPSS apparat, uh, international department, one person. Um, it's uh, also the relatively typical for our group, uh, so called white biographies, so the uh, Few, uh, former uh, biographies family, it's the uh, appearances of the one of the top secret uh, uh, secret uh, secret uh, uh, person who have, uh, who have access the most 
important uh, military secret in the Soviet Union, uh, a person who helped Dmitry Ustinov on VPK. At the same time, his father uh, was pre-revolution high education, and mother was from the uh, uh, St. Petersburg elite. Um, uh, and some um, uh, parents uh, uh, has the relatively high uh, place in the uh, uh, in the pre-revolution elite. For example, on uh, propaganda department are found five relatives of the former members of the state Duma. Uh, from the left parties, nobody from the Bolsheviks, but uh, from different sort of the left parties. And one uh, head of uh, uh, sub-department, Zavidovich Sektoram, was the, uh, his grandfather was the uh, member of the state council of the Russian Empire. And he was the uh, Nobel Fofaza and representative of the uh, very uh, rich uh, uh, trade, uh, 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 very rich trade family from from the mother. So, uh, in this reason, we can see that uh, the uh, top of the Soviet political bureaucracy, CKFSS, uh, uh, was not only very ideological people, but also the people who has a uh, very serious professional uh, uh, success and uh, they was mostly not ideological leaders. They formally was, but really the first one was the uh, normal uh, state staff uh, with the uh, uh, middle class ideology, middle class um, ideas, and middle class evaluation yourself like professional. Uh, so the big part of them, uh, near eighty percent of them, working on the CKPSS just uh, from five to seven years, and then uh, they come to CKPSS in the forties. It's a middle age uh, when they invited was, and after the five, seven, nine years, they moved to some another job. Uh, most of them moved to the um, uh, state, uh, Soviet state apparat, and some of them returned to the, their own professional sphere and the top position, like the chief of the <laughs> institute or the chief of newspaper or something like that. So in these reasons, for them, the KKPSS was not the last bastion of their life, of which they, for, of, uh, they have defense and so on. No, they try to find a good, uh, 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 well, a good place, well place in, uh, in the state or the uh, civil society structure. Because a, a huge number of the civil society structure was under the control of the former CKPSS apparatus. Um, and so I have to finish. It's my very briefly con conclusion about um, uh, this topic. So it was any Ravnapravo quality in the Soviet Union for the uh, small children for, for the small age from 12, the perspective of young men was more uh, uh, or the smallest uh, clear. Uh, uh, most, of the, most of the population have any chance to give real career because they have not enough the education. The problem was that most of the population couldn't finish the 10 classes and couldn't uh, have any chance for the higher education. But political class and the economical class in the Soviet Union uh, um, uh, was integrated just from the people with the higher education. A first one in the, from the top uh, uh, high school in Moscow or some, uh, in St. Petersburg, in Leningrad. 
the Tsukar KPSS children the children of the operation from Tsukar KPSS also to continue this tradition. Big part of them finished the MGU. MGU was like the home high school for the Tsukar KPSS and also MGMO. And then the second question is that they don't want to be the apparatchiki also because the apparatchik is a very nervous work and these children prefer to find some more quiet uh, work because they have the Moscow apartment. It's the most important uh, things in the world. Uh, and from when they have the dependent apartment in, in Moscow who give the appearances and education in Moscow uh, uh, high school. So they provide yourself like the normal Moscow intelligence. Big part of them uh, try to teach Russian for foreigners uh, uh, or move to the mass and physics uh, 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 structure. Uh, and so when you met uh, these guys in, in the Moscow, nothing to represent that there was the member or the children of member political class of Russia. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gloria, and thanks for staying perfectly within time. So we have really 45 minutes now for questions, and I would like to re-invite the speakers back to the tables. Oh, really? Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I was not taking it's only 30 minutes for, for questions, but no less. Um, yeah, and I already saw the first hands raised. They are you. Thank you very much to all of you for the paper. Uh, <laughs> I have a question. Why? I finally understand why you invited me. <laughs> and we used to speak about Shalitin and Sanchasti. And if I had known that earlier, I would have restructured my book at least by including the episode from this prime minister concerning the question whether Sir Humphrey Bosco was a Soviet spy, one of us. It's excellent. But uh, if I may, I would like to comment, you know, because you are personalizing and nationalizing the aspect of the department of Soviet Republics. Okay? And if I, I would not oppose that, but if I read their biographies correctly, so Shalepin left the department during eight months, okay, semi-chastly half a year, while he spent some weeks, okay, so, the, and you suggest that during this short time, he's unexperienced, you know, political, you know, babies, uh, managed to uh, understand the principle of the world and use it in their own direction. Okay, this is something I would like to recommend you to think. Because it was not so. They had tasked for Khrushchev to bring consular people into this structure in order to destabilize de the, 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 the apparatus. That was their basic task. And then uh, they were not independent. Because they had, they they did did not have direct access to Khrushchev. They did have direct access direct access to Kirichenko, who was the party secretary responsible for Kharkov. Okay. So that was also there was a, another channel. They were not that independent, that powerful. And then uh, in the structure, they did not have power to change first secretaries. They were obliged to report to Kirichenko and Khrushchev, and it was their power to change secretaries. But local party secretaries, first secretaries, needed to consult their cadres, for instance, with the department. So that was the structure. They didn't have the direct power, as far as I know. So 
Okay, so I would, and, and last but not least, I would definitely recommend you, you know, to rethink that labels like conservative, Stalinist, uh, progressive, you know, during that period, because what does it mean? I found very different remix of Stalinist during the late 50s, early 60s, and late 60s, for example. I found very different remix of conservative during the late 50s, early 60s, and late 60s. And I don't think in my experience, it's my just reflection and reformation, it doesn't work to label like this. Okay, so that was a deliberate policy of Khrushchev to introduce young cadres to both KGB and the party in order to be Stalinized, uh, to, uh, to conduct the Stalinization. That's why I think here in this particular case, generation is a uh, useful category. Thank you. What do you say, please? Uh, kind of piggybacking on Tomoch's uh, uh, comments, um, in my experience in the same period, maybe not exactly the same, I went to my uh, materials on youth of the folks, uh, the sort of shuffling of people was couched in different language and just a few years prior to what you're talking about. There's corruption, the, the scandal is corruption, not nationalism necessarily. And even, even when that language is introduced in, in this removal and appointment of cadres in Ukraine, it seems that there are underlying phenomena that are being, I don't know if it's coded or simply, you know, nationalism is sort of a placeholder for other things that are going on. So I wonder if you could um, maybe comment on that. I was just wondering about, about the language of it, but also um, where are Ukraine and Belarus and Russia in your story? Is the timing different? I mean, you and I have talked about this before, but a lot of the people that you're mentioning are coming out of these um, sort of bigger Islamic republics. How does that, does that shift the, the story at all? How do you kind of place them in this larger context? Uh, third question, Michael. Um, it's also true. Uh, Michael uh, mentioned uh, back in uh, 2019, the good old days we were sitting in the agony, uh, reading Roman Falls, reading the um, uh, files of the party department within the uh, Central Committee files. Uh, and I would have uh, one question and one uh, little comment. I was wondering when did it start to become a uh, deep state? And what was the reason uh, to emerge? Because my impression when reading the files is a different question. I was looking on how they perceived and uh, exercised exercise collective leadership was that the party department was actually actually not a deep state, but the opposite, a driver of uh, transformation in 1954 and 1955. Uh, they wanted local cars to stick to the new ideals of those. Um, and I was wondering, well, when when did it start to the deep state then? Maybe you should ask the yeah. questions for the others. Well, I, 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 for the moment, it's only for you. I hope next no round question. is for the others. <laughs> okay, so so Thomas, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, um, there's a lot here, and um, like I said, you there's not time for me to read a fifteen thousand word chapter to you to explain point by point precisely why I've come to this conclusion with all the evidence required. But I will say that, um, so yeah, um, I th I didn't say they are independent actors. I said they are influenced by the department. I think that even you, you're saying these babies, it even more reinforces that because they makes them more malleable to me. Um, so yeah, I don't think they're acting on their own. The Kremlin logs show them meet, going for meetings with Khrushchev at this time. So I did think they have access to him. Um, and the other thing, and this is why I, I do want to talk to you about it, but like, you know, um, some of this comes from Semi Chastney's illegally published work that he did with you, um, uh, in which he lays out precisely his involvement with the Azerbaijani and uh, Latvian purges. And there's stuff there that he couldn't have known. And it's, and it's and I know this, and obviously I definitely problematize memoirs. I'm not a, um, a, a total noob, but um, what I'm saying is that 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 the um, with with the memoirs and stuff like 
they, it's remarkable that he's remembering this stuff 30 years later and getting a lot of it right, making some of the interesting mistakes with the names and stuff. But, but um, uh, I'm like, well, you can't not have known this stuff and not be involved. I'm not saying it maybe he's exaggerating slightly. I accept that. But, um, you know, the way he lays it out, it's easy for me to then put the other blocks into place. That's actually the first thing that led me to this conclusion. So, um, uh, so no power to change the first secretary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hence the manipulation. That's what I'm saying. So also labels. This I do agree with you about. Maybe yeah. It's a bit. Um, uh, and there's a better one. Maybe anti-Thor. Um, my, you know, how to how to try and express this dissatisfaction with what is happening. That's what I'm. I, I'm maybe trying to say. Um, and I think as well that these so-called babies the work work. I mean, they were pretty capable. A couple of years later, organizing against Khrushchev very successfully. So um, uh, that's why, yeah, I, as I talked about, not a, not such a big leap. And I think, and as well, their fingers are on the all these documents, like you know, like the Turkmen purge. You know, I, I, I'm not making it up. I'm getting it from what I read. Like like uh, you know, um, uh, it's, especially with regards to to Chilepin for that one. Um, but it's great stuff and I'm loving it. And yes, you're partially here under those reasons, but, but for, for others too, because I like it. So yeah, um, Aricia, yeah. So um, yeah, I think it's an interesting point. Scandal becomes later nationalism. Sure, I mean, Dana said something similar about like the use of, and I think there's a certain thing about excuses and, and like, well, now this is what we get you for, you know, because uh, but I also think it's part of what is happening at that time and a genuine sense of nervousness about the, um, the, the direction things are going in. That's what I read. I mean, I read those genuine concerns and I think that that so. Um, uh, but I also think that I think that it, it can also be accused when not present. It's, it, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it, it almost doesn't matter whether it's there or not there when they're doing this. So um, and. Um, yeah, where are Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia? Well, it's a very good question. I mean, there are significant replacements in in, in you know in, in, in Russian Obkomi at this time in the RSFSR, uh, which I I don't connect. I don't know how you know. Um, uh, and it's also a different department as well. It's the department for the RSFSR. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, seen as more more reliable, perhaps. Um, not not yeah, it's not appearing. I mean, I obviously know other things change later accusations are made against Celeste I mean again you know uh, but um, they don't appear in my story in, the, or in, in this really they don't surface in what what I'm looking at uh, it's other republics um, uh, that's I, I mean that's all I yeah I, um, Martin um, yeah so it's a good question and I, I do remember in those good old days but um, uh, when we were there but um, uh, uh, when 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 Urgani was in the central former central committee uh, you know, headquarters, um, uh, so you're talking about being a driver. I think it's a very different place in 1954, frankly, to what it becomes. Um, and I think I, I didn't because I had to go very fast. Uh, I maybe didn't ex didn't get into the how it, I think the shift is happening in 57. Frankly, I think the department is transforming in 57, and and th and therefore that's why in 58 you start seeing it. But that's when we're seeing more national communism. We're seeing more of these problems, and we're seeing more aggression on the department, you know, on the part of the reporting about what they don't like. So that's what I would say. May I, yeah, may, may I to 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 perhaps to to Thomas, because we, I'm not sure, but but we we should check about Kirichenko. I think in. He worked till 1958 or 1950 in the beginning till the beginning of, but uh, in this uh, purges during this purges time, so already Kozlov, I think he was in, in the position of second secretary, so named second secretary, not Kirichenko. Kirichenko was quite liberal, yes. So, so it, it seems I could agree with you, but already Kozlov was in the position or or not? I'm not sure. So. Okay, so I have now the next round of three questions. I'm not sure if I oversaw somebody there from the beginning. Yeah, I think it was. So the next is here, Ricardo, please. Um, thank you, everybody, for this very uh, interesting presentation. So I have questions for, uh, for, for, uh, for all of you, uh, some in the logical, some in the idea of interpretation. Um, I wanted to ask Salvis, I mean, you and Mike uh, were talking about the manipulation uh, of uh, letters and sometimes it's a, 
uh, orchestration of uh, campaigns, uh, let's see the slanders of, uh, of letters. Um, I was um, very interested in a passage when you were mentioning this letter surveys. How accurate and sincere are these surveys mm -hmm. compiled? Uh, who is um, who is going to, to read this? And uh, I, I was asking um, this question myself because sometimes I was thinking the risk is that they use this letter from the Central Committee maybe to pledge the general secretary, I mean, to give some kind of impression which was not true. So how sincere are, are these letters? Um, for Nicolai, I also very enjoyed this, uh, your, your research. Um, I wanted to ask, where these informations available for all the 236 uh, uh, profiles that you have checked, all the information that you were checked, or some, something was missing? I mean, what, what, was it easy to make this, this account for all the, the, those profiles? And, and then I was also curious that, um, um, that there is this general interpretation that the presidency becomes the continuation of the general secretary, that as far as you are describing just a minimal part, of the of uh, of, uh, of this uh, of this uh, specimen of this uh, uh, of this group that you are considering is then going to the to the presidency of the USSR. Uh, I just want to, uh, to, to ask your comment on uh, on this. Um, and then I had a question for for Mike. I mean, uh, um, the institutional evolution of the deep state. Uh, I wanted to ask you about: uh, Are there any similarities uh, with the? Um, national purges of 1972 in Georgia and Ukraine? Maybe yes, from an institutional point of view with the use of the KGB. Um, and then something maybe changes with the, another round in 85, 86, which maybe might be compared with the 59, 61 period you, you are considering. But in this case, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was wondering whether the Secretariat might be the base for the deep state or, or even the Orgatiel, Ligashov, Solomyentsev, uh, or even other, other guys, uh, I have a long list of names which might be the, 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 the Perestroika Red Cardinals. And then what happened in the 88-91? I mean, do we have a deep state? Is the presidency the new deep state? I mean, since 1990, uh, is the presidency, or do we miss this deep state at this stage? I'm asking this because this might be another interpretation, another explanation to the Soviet collapse. So is something missing? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll start my question. Uh, <laughs> uh, but for a question for Sandra, sorry for uh, for that. Um, so for Sandra, so I, I was really intrigued by the anonymous letter that you presented that you could tell was coming from a, a, a nomenclature or a member of a kind of a you know, company. Um, but surely that's kind of a, that's one of those cases that when it was easy. Were there cases where it's hard to tell whether this is just an individual writing or a member of the Because so you're specifically interested in one of the correspondents, right? So with anonymous letters, how can you tell when it's not so obvious? And, and what do you do with those cases when you're not sure? Um, so I guess it's about the methodology. Because the strategies that that letter used are sometimes shared by individuals saying, well, me and all the people I know think, so I represent the workers, or whatever. How do you know that it was going on? And the question to Nikolai, I'm um, really intrigued by your use of the uh, term middle class ideology, but I think you talk about the consequences of these backgrounds that are not to do with military events. And so my question is, what do you mean by that? Because that was a conscious choice of term middle class ideology. What does that mean in Soviet context? And also, how do you make that um, conclusion, make that argument on the basis of your backgrounds? Is there anything else on which you draw? Uh, do you, because the, how do we know that it happened in open Sovietized them? And uh, how do we know that they happened? Yes, they have very nice apartments, they have specialized systems of course. Is that perhaps they're meant to have a sort of middle class values or products of their current economic circumstances rather than the background of their parents and their kind of mixed and class identity? You know, could you elaborate on that? 
can we leave it with two questions and we have another round of two. Um, Samuel, maybe we can. Oh, yeah, sure. So, yeah. Thank you, Ricardo, for questions. Yeah, so I wouldn't say that uh, this, this uh, surveys were like case of manipulations. So, so it's uh, what, what I am saying. So this department, general department, tried to, to enter into a sphere other departments, like party organ department. Because if we take 50s, 60s, yes, so we press the help of, of 60s. So, so we can see that party organs department, organizational party work department is leading in this issue. So, so nationalism, other, the very similar question is like in the, in the area of this department. But we see from end of 60s and in the and 70s that this department, general department, also entered it, somehow entered it. And they sent curator, they had curator in others, others departments, all departments, like, like Alexandrova in party organ department. And they basing on these letters, on also anonymous letters, as letters from Chernigov about uh, this uh, Shellest, yes. So they composed kind of uh, Zapisky notes. And this is very interesting. So, so they took kind of a new job for, for, for them themselves. So, so and of course, status and importance. And because of that, we, we can see how status of this department is changing and how it was very how I think Yakovlev and Pogos, not, not just Yakovlev, not just Boris Yakovlev, but also Chernenko and mainly Chern Chernenko became like very influential leader. So he used this, this step in controlling and ties with the local party organization because already in 1967, in this resolution issued by Secretariat, you can see like a statement that, uh, that uh, this general, general department should send group of people to, to learn and to, to, to control how, how local party organizations committees are working with these letters. So many issues and new additional issues came to, to, to this department. And yes, so, and because of that department became very powerful. And the service is, it's not, not just, you know, we can't say that just manipulation kind of manipulation. So they, they found, found ways how to work, so how to enter. Yeah. So, and to, to, to answer to Natalia's question, so, so I use, yeah, good question. So I, I use the same methodology, methodology as a communist nomenclature I used, yeah? So, so I said in this, in this, my presentation, it's I follow, you know, content, follow content, because if you know, if you work on nomenclature networks, you, sometimes, you, you know issues, yeah? You, you know, so, so sensitive points. So, and then you see in the document, you can understand. So, and second point. So after I came back from Moscow, it, it was, my visit was in Moscow in Ergani in 2000, in 2020, February. And I, I just before, just before COVID, yeah. So I was very lucky to, to, to find the stuff and make many photocopies. And uh, then I came back, back to, to Vilnius. I started to meet people who are mentioned in these uh, uh, letters and made some interviews with them and they confirmed that uh, this, this was, this is happening. So, so it is true, yeah, so, so it's very easy to, you, 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 you can combine both interviews and documents. So even unsigned documents, you, you can use that. The third point is methodological. <laughs> so is uh, like, uh, not methodological perhaps, uh, all these letters are, is from some files from Dela, yeah? and uh, Dela named his letters against Soviet repayment uh, with compromising literature, so compromising in information about Soviet repayment leadership. So you can see in one papka, in one file, co collected many many letters from 70s to late 80s. So so you can see that this is made, you know. They paid big attention, big attention to the to this to this letters, and uh, the fourth thing is very interesting that, that 
these letters were kept in general department, not in party organ department. So it's it's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, about the level of uh, the informational, uh, I try. I have the uh, big list of the questions to biography. It's uh, near three hundred uh, questions, but of course nobody can uh, answer. It, uh, the, I have no opportunity to answer for all three hundred uh, questions in uh, every case. But anyway, uh, we can try to make some. <coughs> and uh, some aspect of the biography is standard. Uh, you can find the, which uh, the uh, higher education was or what was the uh, working experience before the KKPSS apparat or, uh, uh, or from which city on the fridge, uh, which place uh, this guy's coming on uh, growing up and finished. Um, so I get, I have in my database near 1000 uh, uh, biographies, but uh, I used just the biographies who gave opportunity uh, to work in was, uh, to work in was uh, near the 30 tables. The most uh, problematic questions is the uh, uh, information about the finances and the education. Uh, and the second is the questions about the uh, social uh, activity in the school and uh, and in uh, the high school. So was the guy a pioneer and communal activist or not? Uh, but anyway, uh, I use the biography when we have near the full uh, top uh, the information about, uh, and we can see I, I share the biographies for. Uh, four dimensions, uh, four tube or uh, type of uh, departments, ideological, uh, international, uh, functional, and industrial. And we can see uh, how they build uh, uh, the common places uh, for biographies, people who work in common these departments. For example, uh, people with where the uh, 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 parents is right, uh, reds uh, or whites, uh, most of them working on in the international and uh, ideological departments. In, in the industrial departments, a lot of children of uh, peasants, kulaks, yeah? uh, uh, for example, Yeltsin, like Yeltsin or Chernomyrdin. Uh, uh, and it's, I, I can talked a lot about, about more detail, but I stopped here. Uh, about the uh, uh, president administration. I work in conf with the biographies, uh, people who come to the KPSS before Gorbachev, before, before uh, Gorbachev stayed the general secretary, before the 1985. So the Gorbachev president administration uh, uh, was organized uh, uh, on in, involved the people who come after Gorbachev in the CK KPSS. Uh, so I, I have only a small group who moved from CK to Gorbachev administration, and I don't try uh, to use all my opportunities to talk with the liberal so Gorbachev generation, so that my uh, picture was the more common. Yeah, Liberal Party, of course, uh, talked uh, talked with the interviewer more actively than the conservative. I, I, I try to balance. Um, ideology of middle class. Uh, it, it's ideology where the professionalism is most important things in the world. Uh, the culture and ideology is also important especially culture, uh, culture more than uh, ideology. Uh, and when you have the uh, profession, uh, the profession is connected with the higher education uh, and children have to be go to high school uh, in the 100%. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, also the uh, level of progressism interest to progressism in, in general, not the radical progressism, not especially the radical reform on something 
like that, but the pro, uh, idea of progress and uh, uh, idea that the institute have to work, the hospital have to work, uh, the school have to work, the industry have to work, and so on. Maybe we spare you answer for the last round because we have two questions and two minutes left for this. Okay, okay I'll try and be as quick as I can. Um, so, uh, you might. Um, very intriguing hypothesis. Um, I think the problem is that you have relations between bureaucrats and politicians in all systems. Um, the question is at what point does it become a deep state, if you like? And I think the difficulty for you is that this is a very, very hierarchic system, and you are not going to be able to replace a first secretary or Republic without the express permission of the first secretary, and there have to be some pretty good reasons as well. And I think there is an argument for the reason why push short terms. And if you look at that particular discussion on the 1st of July 59, he turns against particular first secretaries because he sees that their actions are undermining, they're against the center, they're undermining the central policy. And, and there's a transition, there's a difference between undermining, working against other republics, which they can just about tolerate. The moment that their, that their actions are seen as are deemed um, to work against the centre, that, 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 he, that he makes that decision. And I think what you would need methodologically is to show that Khrushchev has a position um, and that the, this deep state is producing an outcome that is against what he wants. And I don't think you're doing that at the moment. I have a question for Saudi, but I'll leave it for later. So. Oh, my, it was already asked that it's about the left, sorry. Okay, thank you. This very, one, one, one short question. Well, we can discuss it later, but I was just intrigued by your description of the, the of the Central Committee of Conservative States, and the privileges um, and stuff. And then Nicolas was describing this place in a later period, of course, but of higher mobilization where people were working there for five, six years, and that produced a generation of people that were more liberal. But there was this thing, and so that the two questions were first whether this evolution within the Central Committee reflects the overall of society. This is also a question for Salas that we can discuss. I mean, you all know uh, better than, than me. And the second is whether the fact that the mobilization was so high was uh, part of a logic of the system. They wanted people and a renewal of educators, or was the way the career was guaranteed that pushed people to look for other positions which were better, even with more privileges. No time left, but you are the master. I'll do time. it in one Please. second. Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, so, so, um, Ricardo, I can say to you that. Uh, uh, so, no, I'm, I, I may not have explained. So, the deep secretariat for me can't be a deep state because it is the top. So, it, you know, like uh, effectively, it's part of the top institution. So, um, uh, as to later com um, uh, comparisons, I would defer to the Georgianists, to the Ukrainianists, uh, who are the experts. I would not. Presume to know about enough about 1972, uh, really, to tell you, um, or about uh, the mid 80s. I, I don't really see much of a comparison, to be honest. Um, uh, I think it's interesting that Kozlov's name came up because he was a big person involved in the Tajik one, actually, and um, uh, and uh, uh, and a lot of the source from that comes from Mukhitinov and their arguments over it, actually, and the need and Mukhitinov saying, well, Khrushchev and I don't want to do this, and uh, yeah, so um, uh, and then so Yoram, yeah. Um, so problems of relations between bureaucrats. And yeah, I get it, but um, uh, and and he's turning against them. I, I, I read it a different way. I actually think that um, uh, if you look at it with, with Latvia, it's a desperation not to, to get rid of them. It's to pump the decision back to them and to not get rid of them. Um, uh, so um, I, 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 and with Azerbaijan, uh, the key there is about saying. Um, you know, when, when Mustafa says, says, no, 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 Shikin's lying to you. I'm, I, I didn't say this. I, did, I, I, I haven't done this kind of stuff. Um, and he says, I was told something different by them, you know. And, and then when you look at what Semi Chasny says uh, behind the scenes about it, that they went to Khrushchev and they tried to influence him about what was happening. So 
you you have the 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 leader trying to say no we're still your guys we're, we're on side we're just carrying um and i think this thing we're just carrying the the banner of desalinization to the periphery um uh we're not against you and it's attempting to make sure that the premier thinks that they're against them is what i argue but you'll have to read the chapter and make your own call <laughs> One sentence to, you know, you're going to discuss this during the break. Um, perhaps. Thank you.